You are listening to The Cycling Podcast with Lionel Burney, Daniel Freeb, and Richard Moore. Happy New Year, Lionel Burney. Happy New Year, Richard Moore. And Happy New Year, Daniele Friberancini. Hello, chaps. How are you? You're looking very svelte after the Christmas period. It might just be the slightly dodgy um, FaceTime connection that we've got, but... Yeah, well, you're you're, slimming. You're, you're in your new Berlin studio there. Well, um, I'm actually in Acapulco. Oh, what? So I'm in a meeting room called Acapulco. All oh, right, okay. Um, I'm in some hip co-working place in Berlin, and, you know, I'm here sort of swirling a... a well, I'm not swirling a lot. I'm, I'm not actually swirling my cappuccino around... Um, around my artisanal mug because um obviously it's too late for that it's um it's <laughs> past midday but you um well you're in your element there surely um amongst the hipsters of berlin in a in a shared working space daniel it's where i always saw you ending up yep 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 whereas lionel and i we're in london here uh, beside a building site we are near st pancras station uh, usual home venue for us this isn't it Richard um, kicking off the year as uh, well not as we ended last year of course because we ended last year's regular podcast with a game of Scrabble in a pub with Ned Bolting um, if you haven't listened to that do go back you're Don't. in for a treat well <laughs> we, we thought about just, just doing that every week for the podcast didn't we a different board game every week but we're not going to do that well I thought maybe next year or rather this year now we'll play Monopoly and whoever is uh, Team Ineos gets um, all of the money um, all the stations. Maybe it'll be Jumbo Visma by the well. end of the year, Lionel. <laughs> Maybe Jumbo Visma will be the new Team a game, Enios. A game of cycling theme Monopoly. How would that go? Well, I mean, uh, who we signed the who signed the old boot for 2020? <laughs> <coughs> if you if you're Enios, do you have would you would you be parking a um, an enormous camping car instead of or uh, rather than a hotel on Park Lane? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, this could run and run. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to say something about um, going directly to... to uh, no, I don't want to say that, do I? I don't want to say that. No. <laughs> um, so, chaps, well, this is our first podcast of 2020. Um, and as tradition dictates, I think, we're going to look ahead to the, the season. Um, but we, well, we, we kind of had a couple of slightly different podcasts towards the end of last year, didn't we? We had we heard from Flavio Zappi, your interview, Lionel, and we heard again from the young the youngish Americans. So we didn't have a, a news roundup for a while. Do you have uh, some bullet points, some headlines for us? Well, just the, the most recent bullet points. Not going to recap everything that's happened over the winter. I think uh, as the as the season unfolds, we will uh, cover a lot of the uh, stories as they uh, as they come at us. But just a few things that have happened over the first part of this week. The Tour de France is a has finalised uh, the team lineup for the 2020 Tour. It will, of course, be the 19 World Tour teams plus uh, the French team Total Direct Energy, who qualify via the UCI rankings. And the two wild cards are Arkea Samsic. No real surprise there um, because they have Naira Quintana, of course, and uh, the Dandelion Picker, Daniel. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how they... Uh, gel as a, as teammates as the season goes on, and the other he's going to give us his actual name. Uh, I like that. It's just a dandelion picker. Well, now. well I was hoping he'd pick, chip in the Warren Bargill. That Warren Bargill just to give him um, his old name stone, and some old some stone face Nairo Quintana and the dandelion picker. Already a winner, Quintana this year. Y- yeah, true. In a in a sort of club race, though, wasn't it? No, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I think yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, it looked fantastic that it race. Um, there were there were clips that went round online of. Um, well, it was sort of pub cycling, um, the way it was described, um, a sort of impromptu, informal uh, mountaintop finish on, on, a, on a cobbled climb about 17,000 metres above sea level in, in <laughs> Colombia. But it looked, just, um, it looked quite impressive. You know, we spend the winter playing, playing Scrabble in pubs and Quintana just goes out and rides a 17,000 metre climb. Absolutely. He looked, he, looked, he looked pretty good in his new Arkea Samsic kit. Uh, the other wildcard team is the BB Hotels Vitel Concept, which uh, means there's no place for Wanty Group Gobert. Um, they paid the price really for losing Guillaume Martin, I would suggest. Um, the, the one great benefit I see in this announcement, chaps, is that um, if I'm not mistaken, I didn't meant to check this before the, the pod today, but um, when B&B announced their sponsorship um, by that company, 
Um, they did make mention of the fact that they would, they would try wherever possible to be staying in that particular um, chain of hotels. And hopefully that means that all the B&B hotels will be booked up for <laughs> France and we won't have to stay in them because I don't know if you chaps have spent much time in um, B&B hotels over the last um, few years, but I'm not a huge fan, I have to say. It can't be as bad as Formula One. Surely. No, they're better than Formula One and mm. better than Premier Class as well, but um, mm. slightly inferior to Ibis, um, I would say. I- Ibis budget or Ibis? Because there's two, isn't there? There's, there's two tier. There's Ibis à deux vitesse, isn't there? There's Ibis and Ibis budget. Ibis budget is kind of there's a also There's cube. another Ibis as well. We stayed in one in uh, Toulouse last year. Very nice Ibis. I can't remember what the branding is, but it was, it was a nice one. Well, this isn't the hotels podcast, is it? No. Although we probably should do a GC of, of uh, chain hotels at some point, or a GC of just hotels that we stay in. We really, every year we say this, let's keep a proper... Well, it was an episode of Columbus Zero, wasn't it? One, uh, one of our listeners ranked all the hotels that the team stayed in last year. That's right. Um, but we should really, uh, we, should, we should document where we stay. Remember to take photos of every hotel. Uh, maybe put them in our next book. We're, 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 we've been talking about that, just yeah. that very thing, yeah. Anyway, um, the racing is already underway, not just um, impromptu um, show up and race events in Colombia, but the Australian National Championships are underway. The time trials have already uh, taken place. Sarah Giganti won the women's time trial. She, of course, won the road race last year, so she's added a time trial title this year. And the, the men's race was won by Luke Durbridge of Mitchelton Scott by 18 seconds from the world time trial champion, Rowan Dennis of Team Ineos. And Durbridge has said that um, Dennis's presence in the event really uh, you know, gave him the spur that he needed to win the title. Uh, Jumbo Visma's Chris Harper was third there. Um, what else is new for 2021? Well, there's loads new, and we'll, we'll talk about a bit of that in this episode, won't we? But the, the two things in the sort of the, the overall team makeup that uh, everyone needs to get to grips with is that Cofidis are back in the top division. They're in the World Tour this year with uh, Elia Viviani racing for them, having transferred across from De Koenig Quickstep. And the Israel Startup Nation is the new World Tour team in the sense that it's taken over Katusha Alperson's licence and quite a few of their riders um, will probably talk about Israel Startup Nation a little bit later on in the podcast. And today, the route of Paris Nice has been unveiled. It always uh, keeps me on tenterhooks. This, you know, how will they get from Paris to Nice? Uh, well, they're going from Plaisir, which is near Paris, and they're finishing in Nice. Richard, would you <laughs> believe it? Wow. More news like that over the next 360 odd days of the year. I bet you can't wait. Well, we were going to uh, look ahead, each of us, to sort of pick out three things that we were looking forward to in 2020 races riders teams um and i think we were gonna start the year with 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 that um have you picked out three things lionel are you starting or daniel are you starting daniel are you getting us getting us rolling in 2020 well richie i'll start i'll start with israel startup nation um in fact um snappy new name or or rather um Three teams, them being one of them, um, who I think in 2020 will be really looking to sort of build, create a, a new identity. Um, the others being Bahrain, McLaren, and um, also NTT, formerly Dimension Data. Um, Bahrain, McLaren, new management with Rod Ellingworth sort of pulling the strings there. And um, NTT, we think there's going to be a press conference in Denmark today to announce that Bjarne Reese is the new team manager. Um, just very briefly on three teams, um, Katusha Alperson, um, or the, the sort of carcass of, of um, Katusha Alperson as um, was provided a lot of riders for um, Israel Startup Nation, but you know we saw how that team kind of fell apart at the end of last year. Um, lots of different nationalities um, involved. And... Um, yeah, no real sort of clear soul to that team, Katusha Alperson, at the end, and, and um, Israel will have to find that. Um, Bahrain, uh, McLaren, still questions there over how to sort of mesh this, this new um, British influence with the old 
um, Slovenian, Croatian um, body of sort of staff and the questions there also um, that came up last year about the Operation, Operation Adelas doping investigation. And then NTT with Reese, um, a team that desperately needed a new direction, a, a sort of strong hand guiding them. Um, they've opted for Reese. That's going to be controversial, but might also, um, well, I'm not going to say it's going to be, a sh it's not, I'm not going to say it'll be a shot in the arm. Um, but, but hopefully it will give them a bit of a boost. I mean, there was rumoured that Shane Sutton was in the frame for that, that job. Um, so if, if I guess if they had to go with Shane Sutton or Bjarne Rees, um, well... It's close, it's, isn't it? it, it but it's, Reece it's just an gets it. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> appointment, uh, that's for sure. Um, but we were at uh, Bahrain McLaren's sort of official launch in December, weren't we, Lionel? Yeah, we went down to Woking... For, which is the headquarters, of course, of McLaren, the, the Formula One and supercar company. Um, I'm quite impressed with the, the, the you know, the the, the, the the slickness, I guess, of the, the presentation. We were in, a, we were in a, a room which was a bit like the Starship Enterprise, uh, all seats um, around a, um, a, a sort of a, a nicely lit floor, and, and one by one the, the people came and, and talked to us. It wasn't a great deal of uh, opportunity for, um, you know, to, to glean much information about what was going on but one thing that I did pick up was that um, I mean I, I had a couple of conversations afterwards with with people from um, McLaren and I, I was just thinking you know on, in a sort of geopolitical sense I wonder how we will look back on this era of not just cycling but all kind of professional sports the way the direction that professional sports are going in and, and this was a thought that was sparked by one of the people from McLaren um, kind of glossing over the era of tobacco sponsorship in, in uh, Formula One and, and you know he kind of caveated uh, um, the, 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 an anecdote about how important um, Marlborough's sponsorship or the Philip Morris company's sponsorship of the team had been in the, in the 70s and 80s um, when, when they were de but frankly desperate for money. And I did kind of make the comment, I wonder how future generations will look back on um, a team sponsored by you know, a, a, a Middle Eastern state and a supercar company. And, and one of the things that I picked up just from the presentations, and I haven't sort of followed this up, but a sense that perhaps there is a sort of medium and longer term um, uh, strategy at play here for a company like McLaren. They were talking a bit about how um, having the cyclists and, and working with, with uh, athletes who obviously, you know, go to extremes in endurance will 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 feed back and give them information about um about hu human beings and health and uh and how the human body responds to things and i i just picked up a small glimmer of perhaps something because we're always trying to piece together you know what's in it for a company like McLaren to get involved in cycling. It's not like they're even getting involved in developing bikes at the moment. That was something that they they said they weren't interested in at the moment, and, and that was something that I just, as a uh, from a distance, thought. Well, maybe there's a fit there. Perhaps McLaren could develop their own uh, bikes, as that they they work in many of the same materials. But just quickly on uh, on. Barre McLaren as well. I was surprised to see Milan Erzen, um, one of the a former rider, of course. He was a sort of uh, a, a, a bit of a sprinter, rode for a small Slovenian team at the end of the 90s, and has been uh, a part of this investigation, the Operation Adelas investigation. And um, I, from sort of off the record or, or sort of background conversation, had been led to believe that Erzen had been pushed into very much the, the background. Um, but he was there at the well, He's co-managing director he, of the team with yeah. John Allert from McLaren. Uh, that's right, Rich. I gather that... Um, the UCI weren't terribly happy that Erzen wasn't on the team's official staff list, didn't have an official role um, last year when the Operation Adelas story broke. That uh, caused them some concerns to have someone uh, clearly associated with the team, working with the team, but not officially part of the roster. And um, as I understand it, the UCI has requested that the team give Erzen a formal role um, as part of the, the World Tour licence uh, process. That was a requirement made of the team. Uh, I gather, as we speak, that um, uh, you know that that's something that's, that's still pending. Um, but uh, the intention is, uh, from the UCI's point of view, that uh, they firm up Erzen's position within the team, so that they, I guess, so that there isn't a situation where people are working with the team but are kind of uh, in in the background. Uh, they want they want to know everybody who is uh, associated with the team. 
but you wonder if he's on borrowed time uh, a little bit. Um, maybe the team feel they can't do anything uh, while the, there's nothing concrete from the investigation. But also what the implications would be for the, the Bahrain sponsorship were anything to happen in terms of uncovering stuff about him. Who knows? I well. guess we'll find out. Mm. Um, just on Israel startup nation as well. I mean, uh, you you mentioned the team, uh, uh, Daniel. They've obviously been uh, developing over the last few years as Israel Cycling Academy, but they are uh, they are as you say, very international team, but very reliant. It looks from the roster on uh, Dan Martin and uh, and Niels Pollitt for the well the classics, but also probably the Tour de France. I mean, Pollitt is a an up and coming rider. Um, Dan Martin is he is he in decline? We know that. Andre Greipel, who's joined that team as well, is is beyond a fading force. I mean, he's not even. Is he still fading? Is well, he still? Is he? Is there still flickers of life in Andre Greipel? But they are. It does. It does look quite, um, quite threadbare. The the, the lineup for Israel uh, startup nation. I think the thing is, this is um, very much a marriage of convenience, isn't it? Really, if you think back to when the Giro d'Italia started in Israel. Uh, Sylvan Adams was the driving force behind uh, the Giro going to Israel. He is also uh, one of the, the biggest figures behind the team. And uh, he stated then that his ambition was to get into the World Tour one way or another. And I know, you know, when Team Sky were, um, when Sky was dropping out and Team Sky was looking for an alternative, I, I gather, I don't know whether there were any talks, but I know, that, you know well, it was reported, wasn't it, that Adams was um, very keen to, uh, you know, see if there was any opportunity to get into the World Tour that way. That didn't happen, of course. And uh, Katusha, the license, the UCI World Tour license becoming available, gave him the opportunity and gave the team the opportunity. And they've really had to um, do the best. It looks like a kind of a a best case scenario they, they've taken riders from Katusha who um, had contracts that went beyond the end of last year they've taken some of the riders across from Israel one man that's uh, not um, kept a spot in the Israel side of the uh, bargain was Connor Dunn of course um, the former Irish champion he's not there but uh, Dan Martin is an interesting signing gives them some punch for uh, the Ardennes races and, and stage racing in general. Um, but it does look like a sort of um, a, a, a bit of a supermarket sweep of a team. Cobbled really. together team. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Rory, I th I Suth Rory Sutherland, 37, you know, Alex, um, Andre Greipel, Alex Dowsett. You know, there's some there's some quality in there and some, some experience. Um, but whether or not there's a, a raft of wins, I don't know. No, I think I think they'll be fine um, when they're fielding their sort of A and even A and a half team. Um, there are some riders who have been um, slowly sort of developing under the radar and, and getting good results the last few years, like Hermans um, and Chimolai had a very good season last year. Um, but it's it's in the sort of lesser World Tour races and the sort of sub World Tour races particularly towards the back end of the season, where I think they might struggle, especially if the big names haven't haven't delivered um and you know it's a team that you could well imagine getting sort of halfway through the season with not many wins because they don't appear to have a prolific sprinter in there certainly Gripo is no longer a prolific sprinter on the evidence of the last couple of years um so that could be a bit of a problem um and just lastly on NTT um you know I sort of flippantly said that Reese could be the man to to galvanize them um I think that probably will be the case and especially when you um, look at the, the sort of stars that didn't perform last year. Michael Valgren was the big big name signing that really had a disastrous last year. Not, um, I understand, I believe through lack of kind of effort or lack of um, you know hard training, um, but more because um, he he got things slightly wrong in his training. And Reese, what, whatever you, else you think of him and say about him, um, he he is he does have this quiet sort of slightly menacing charisma and an ability to to motivate people and a fellow um, Dane of course and a fellow D Dane so I, I think I mean they, I think they've got a good roster as well I think they've got um, riders who can do well on a variety of different terrains and um, I think they'll have a, a much improved season what else are you looking forward to Daniel 2020 well Rich um, I'm looking forward to the unusually for me I'm looking forward to the Tour de France um, or, or Nice Paris as they're also calling it of course it's oh, oh, very good 
finishes in Paris. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to the first week of the Tour de France, the most weltified um, first Tour de France week um, in, that we can remember. I mean, we have talked about this kind of weltification of the Tour de France, um, the, the search for sort of more gimmickry, um, things to spice, spice the race up, make it a little bit more interesting and maybe break the stranglehold of of what was Sky. Um, this year, um, that is particularly the case in the first week with the start in Nice. Um, the first stage, I think, is going to be a sprint. But thereafter, you know, there's a mountain stage on stage two, a bona fide mountain stage. Um, the race is going over 1,500 metres altitude twice. Um, and another mountain stage, a mountaintop finisher, Ossier en Merlet, made famous in 1971 for Louis Arcagna taking Eddie Mertz to the, to the cleaners. That's on day four. Um, and then another mountaintop finish of sorts on, on day six um, at the Mont Igual. Um, and that is, was made famous by um, Tim Crabber's The Rider. Mont Egual, not the hardest climb, but um, it's gonna, it's gonna certainly, um, it will break things up in the general classification, and um, you know it's, it's a very unfamiliar looking first week of the Tour de France, and I think a lot of the teams will be um, very uncertain as to how it's going to play out, um, and um, yeah, and, and besides that, it's going to be absolutely beautiful as well. Uh, Mont Egual is a stunning, um, is a stunning location in the Cévennes. Um, the Devolui Mountains um, on stage four, as I said, um, Orsia en Merlet, that's another really beautiful part of the Southern Alps. So I think that's going um, to be a real refreshing change for, for the first week of a Tour de France. I'm kicking myself for missing uh, the opportunity to coin Nice Paris, um, but I'm going to say it so often that people would just think that it was my idea. Sorry, sorry about that, Daniel. Um, the Mont, uh, Mont Aiguel, uh, I went on a geography field trip there where in uh, sixth <laughs> form at school um, it, it, and I can, I can remember the roads being extremely twisty uh, because everyone got, got car sick in, in the bus. Um, but it's also absolutely stunning and really quite Did remote. you have extra responsibilities on that as a school captain on the... <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. Um, I think I've been wait, waiting six years to say that on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, 2020 the, started well. The uh, but it's a, it's a re- it's quite remote territory for the Tour de France. That the Cévennes it doesn't doesn't go into that terrain. We go to the Massif Central a little bit over quite frequently, but the Cévennes is um, well, it's narrow roads and, and really quite remote towns and villages. I'm looking yeah, forward to kilometre zero recreating that geography field trip. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and chaps, linking to that, um, the third thing I'm mainly looking forward to um, in um, 2020 um, is, well, the, the prospect, the likelihood of uh, Thibaut Pino and Julien Alaphilippe encore in the Tour de France. Um, that's to say... Um, you know that pair, the, the two French riders, recreating sort of some of the excitement they provided in 2019. Um, will they? Won't they? I mean, I've got my my doubts. Um, Pino, I think, as I mentioned when the um, or as I felt when the tour route was unveiled, um, it, it will it will play both for both in his favour and and against him. I think in the sense that you know this first week where. Um, the, the stress levels might fall slightly when the, there's a first sort of shake-up in the general classification on the second day. Um, the might, well, the, the, the race for the yellow jersey um, will certainly be sort of taken away from the sprinters. That might help matters, make it a bit less stressful. We know he doesn't like the sort of stress on the flat days. Um, on the other hand, there are so many general classification days in this Tour de France he's going to have to stay focused um, for the, the you know you always have to stay focused in the Tour de France um, and it, particularly I mean, he, in his case on the flat days but I just think that um, he's going to have to perform and he's have, going to have to come to the fore on 15 or 16 of the of the 21 days and um, you know that that has been his issue so far um, in his Tour de France career, in his Grand Tour career. Um, when things are not going perfectly for him, um, they can also very quickly fall apart, and that that's. 
kind of what happened last year. It worries me a little bit that when he talks about the knee injury that he had in the Alps, um, he still says that it, it was a mystery. Um, you know, I remember the days um, when it happened last year or after it happened and talking to the Francis de Jeux staff and, and, and they were completely flummoxed and perplexed by it. And, you know, this is a rider who, um, you know, ha- has, has a sort of history of, of, of experiencing problems, you know, when the pressure um, is at its... And I, it's most intense. Yeah, and I think psychologically this is really difficult for him because in the, his last two, the, the last not that his last two Grand Tours because he rode a Vuelta as well, but in the Giro in 2018 and the Tour in 2019. And the Giro, remember, he he sort of manoeuvred himself into a podium position there, didn't he? With with one day to go, really, and then fell apart. And then the, the, it, it repeated at the Tour where it was in the last 48 hours of the race that suddenly he he fell apart. Now both legitimate medical reasons the first i think he he suffered uh you know a, a sudden illness and quite a serious illness and at the the tour de france last year it was the injury but the no matter how well the first two and a half weeks goes for him he's still got this 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 uh, historic problem you know that simon yates might have had as well had he repeated uh his giro 2018 experience um you know again and i think psychologically for him winning the vuelta that year was very important but for Thibaut Pino putting it all together over three weeks is something well he did it in 2014 of course but he hasn't done it really since then and that is a big hurdle to overcome especially when nowadays the last couple of days of a Grand Tour are so important the one thing in his favour is the finish to, to, to this year's Tour the La Planche de Belfi time trial you know that's a more controllable event it's a climb he knows very well it's local to him but still there'll be this this mental hurdle to overcome i think in the final few days of the tour and rich you know what i said about um the route being a bit of a gift and a curse for him you know even that the prospect of that um, final time trial to la planche de de belfi on his doorstep where he grew up um you know that could be something to look forward to or something which becomes a bit of a burden that he will feel that you know, if he's not there and if he's not in contention on that day, he's almost, um, you know, he's letting people down, which of course is not the case. But, um, you know, it, it, it feels almost as though everything, all the stars are aligned for him and the route is, is made for him. And, and that creates um, its own sort of burden. As, as regards Alaphilippe, um, you know, there's, there's been a, a debate that sort of opened up about whether he should switch focus in his career. He sort of batted that back and said that, no, he doesn't, he doesn't intend to become a, a, a sort of GC rider or, or certainly build his, his season around challenging the Tour de France. Um, I also don't think he has to um, with this Tour de France route. The, the way it's set up, OK, there are summit finishes. He's not a pure climber, but they're not steep climbs in that first week of the Tour de France. I just think he needs to ride exactly the way he always rides. And he, he will probably end up in the yellow jersey in the first week of the Tour de France. And from there, um, we saw what happened with this huge you know, wave of, of, of well, this, this momentum that came really from the French public, the French media um, last year. And um, he can surf that and he will surf that. He's someone who, f- who feeds off that, um, whereas other, other sort of riders pale and, and kind of go into their shell. Um, amid that sort of adulation, that's not what happens to Alaphilippe. So, you know, he can he can carry the momentum of the first week into the second week, and um, and then hope to sort of hold on. I mean, with him l- last year, it's almost um, he's the kind of guy who, if he ever does win a Grand Tour, um, it's sort of um, you know it's like a balloon deflating, and it, he just has to s- stop the balloon um, or, or sort of slow down that process of the, of the air coming out of the balloon and, and hope to sort of dribble over the line a, t- um, and a tight he, knot is the key yeah and and that's pretty you know that, that's almost what he achieved um last year my, my doubt this time is that the last week is so um is so hard that i mean i was talking about balloons i'm not sure how that actually <laughs> translates into cyclists but anyway take that from but, take from that what you will julian my my doubt this year is that the the last week is so hard um, that if he's already sort of running on fumes, then it will be it will be difficult. Um, and they're also probably um, going to be more contenders. Last year, I mean, it's perhaps unkind to Egan Bernal to to feel that you know the absence of Froome made the tour and the, the battle for the general classification feel a little bit sort of decaffeinated. 
Um, and, and, you know, riders will drop out or there'll be, there'll be illnesses and injuries that crop up between now and July. Um, but looking at it now, um, in January, it seems as though there are going to be an awful lot of, of very strong contenders for the Tour this year. Chute, uh, chute à l'arrière du peloton, cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. Well, that's the familiar voice of Seb PK, um, race radio at the Tour de France, of course, interrupting this week's episode to remind me to tell you that it's sponsored by the Watt Bike Atom. Indeed it is. Um, the Watt Bike Atom sponsored the bulk of our Tour de France coverage last year, and they are back for 2020. And what a great time of year to talk about the Watt Bike Atom because it's it's January, it's the, the peak season for indoor training, of course, and, well, if you're thinking of uh, upgrading your indoor cycling equipment why not look at the Watt Bike Atom um, because it's a it's the one piece of kit for the job isn't it um, we both Richard took delivery of a Watt Bike Atom to have a test ride that's why we were in such year. good shape at the Tour de France <laughs> last year Lionel because we both we used the Watt Bike Atom uh, in the run up to the tour just to get just to arrive there in peak fitness and then waste it all on <laughs> lots of big meals and sitting in a car for three weeks. But it, it did. It, I've, I've really enjoyed it um, as much as you can enjoy um, hurting yourself on a bike indoors. But um, the information that you get, um, the the stability of the machine itself, um, made it as enjoyable as it could be, and also made the time pass a lot more quickly, especially the sort of the data that you were getting back from your rides. Uh, certainly for me, it felt like a big step up from connecting your uh, your own bike to a turbo trainer. Um, the Watt Bike Atom is built for the purpose. It's very stable. It's got drop handlebars on it that, you know, make you feel as close to riding a bike outdoors as you can indoors, I think. Um, and for somebody like me who, you know, I like to be able to turn things on and, and, and get straight into it, there was absolutely no faff connecting up with, uh, with, with Zwift and with Trainer Road and uh, with the other apps that are available. So you can basically just get, or get it uh, in, set up, plugged in, and um, away you go. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the data and the information that you get. The one that, that fascinated me was the uh, pedal effectiveness score. Um, that I was using the, the Watt Bike app for that and uh, getting lots of informa- information back about the differences in, in the balance between my right leg and my left leg, my effectiveness at all um, parts of the pedal stroke. And, you know, one of the, one of the well, the, po- the whole point of training is to see progress, isn't it? And and I, and one thing I enjoyed about having the the Watt Bike Atom for a while was being able to see my my progression, being able to make little improvements, and then to see whether they'd been uh, f- effectively sort of uh, transmitted in my training. And that was the most enjoyable and rewarding part of it. Uh, well, the the fastest track to improvement is is following a structured plan, of course. And the Watt Bike Atom has a range of workouts and training plans. So if you're riding a big sportive in the summer, or you're you know getting ready for uh, a, a multi-day cycling event, or you just want to get quicker on the bike and uh, leave your buddies behind on the hills, then uh, check out the Watt Bike Atom. Um, and if you want to purchase one from seventy six pounds per month, visit Watt whatbike.com that's whatbike w-a-t-t-b-i-k-e.com the cycling podcast for the latest news views and interviews from the world of professional cycling support our work and get exclusive episodes by becoming a friend of the cycling podcast go to the cyclingpodcast.com forward slash subscribe well, we must say a big thank you to all of you who have signed up as a friend of the podcast. We uh, launched our new program of Friends Special Episodes about a month ago, and there's been an overwhelming response to that, really, our, our best ever. So we're very grateful to all of you who have signed up. There are four episodes now available on our new system, and I think that's one reason why so many of you have signed up. It's very, very easy to use, very easy to sign up, and very easy to get the episodes straight onto your phone. Uh, so the four that are there are the stage that didn't finish. That's a look at stage 19 of the Tour de France that was cut short and also an interview with Egan Bernal. We've also got our Grand Tour Diaries, the first installment of those from the Giro d'Italia. Um, that's basically the audio book of our physical book. We've got the best bits from our own Grand Tour, our shows in Belfast and Edinburgh feature in that episode. 
And uh, we've also got an old episode there that you voted for on Twitter to appear in the new feed. That is our special from a few years back, looking at the HTC High Road team, the best team of this century, we said. Um, that may be subject to discussion, but it's there as well now. There's lots more coming. Tour de France diaries are coming soon. It costs £15 to become a friend of the podcast. If you pay a bit more, um, if you pay £50, uh, you can get a signed copy of our book. You'll get that sent to you. If you pay £100, you'll get a signed copy of the book. And you can also submit an idea uh, for our, well, to, to guest edit our friend's special later in the year. We've done that the last couple of years with great success. Uh, there's a little bit of a backlog with the books at the moment. Um, it's been Christmas and we, had, we have to get them all signed. So uh, we're a wee bit behind you. you should, if you signed up as a friend by Christmas, you should have your book by now. But if you signed up over Christmas uh, and since then, it should be arriving the next week or so. Yeah. Um, In the next week. Just on the, the new system, I mean, it's give, got our creative uh, ideas flowing, hasn't it? Because the system is so much easier for people to use. It's making us uh, think about what we can what we can do to um, deliver value for um, the support that you're giving us. So thank you very much for that. Just a couple of sort of technical points. Um, if you're a previous friend of the podcast, this is a new system. So your old password and, and what have you uh, is not compatible and, and is not needed. Um, and also, if you do have any issues with getting connected first time, um, don't sort of labour away uh, in, in silence. Drop us a line. Contact at thecyclingpodcast.com. Our um, tech genius, Jonathan Rowe, will, um, will sort you out and make, ensure that you get to listen to the episodes that you've signed up to listen to. And a big thanks for the support, because not only do you get the episodes, you do help us uh, produce this weekly free show, the monthly shows that we do, Service Course, the Cycling Podcast Femina, and Explore, and to cover the Grand Tours on the ground and with daily episodes. So if you enjoy the podcast and you want to support it, um, £15 uh, goes a long way. And uh, you can also get 20% off the book if you do sign up as a, as a basic friend of the podcast. So... Uh, lots of reasons to sign up as a friend of the podcast. If you just want to buy the book, you can also do that by going to thecyclingpodcast.com. Uh, still copies are available. So I uh, hope you're enjoying the book if you're reading it. And thanks very much, everybody, who's bought a copy. Okay, well, I'll go. Well, I with three things that I'm looking forward to in 2020. Um, I mean, everybody or a lot of people are talking about Enios v. Jumbo Visma, uh, the battle, especially at the, at the Tour de France. Um, but, I mean, Jumbo in particular... I did a French special on that team last year, and it was clear that they were a team going places. Uh, they've they've added Tom de Moulin this year, so they're they've already announced their team for the Tour de France. Um, George Bennett is the only one that might be slightly uh, miffed at missing out, but maybe he's got other other targets. What what do you think about that announcing the Tour de France team before Christmas? I mean, it's a great idea, but I mean, a lot there's a lot of road to travel between now and the end of June, isn't there? Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a yeah. There's a it's cautionary a of tale intent as well, it? isn't it? There, there's a cautionary tale as well from a couple of was it two years ago with Mitchelton Scott and Caleb Ewan, um, where they pr- they put out a press release press release in the December, the previous December, um, a lot of hullabaloo about the fact that he was going to ride his first Tour de France. And then it was the, um, it became, well, a real bone of contention, didn't it? Because they didn't pick him and, and that then led him not renewing his contract. I think that for Jumbo Visma, it's just, it's a statement. It's, uh, you know, this is how, this is how dialed we are and how, how much we, you know, how much we already know about what we're going to do next year. Um, it's sort of taking the battle to Ineos. Um, it's interesting how that team has developed. There was a, an interview uh, yesterday, I think, with uh, Nielsen Paulus, who's joined EF Education First, a very promising young American rider. And he felt that the, the regime at Jumbo Visma was, was too, too much, especially the focus on diet. And it's interesting because I was at the training camp last year in Spain, in Catalonia, and they were they were on a special day where they were um, following a particular diet. They weren't they were they were not eating very much at all. You know, it was it was a no carbs day, um, but with a double training session. And it was clear that you know the fo- the, the focus is as much on on that side of it as on the the, the training, the physiological aspect. But they um, when you think about how the team has has really transformed from what was a, a pretty weak team, Lotto NL Jumbo. Um, they had a pretty, 
pretty average kit, didn't they? That white and yellow, and, and that was a sort of symbol for how the team were performing. And it was really Stephen Croiswick at the 2016 Giro that, that he was the first sign that, you know, that there might be something to build on there. And, and they, since then, they've kind of... Um, they, they've, they've been very impressive. Primoz Roglic, of course, is likely to be the leader at the Tour de France, but Tom de Moulin will be there too, and Stephen Kreiswick, who finished on the podium last year, of course. Um, so I'm very interested to see how that plays out. Um, Rich, just um, I, I read that interview as well with Nielsen Paulus. I, I found it fascinating. It, it did make me wonder um, to what extent, you know, as we talk more and more, and we have done over the past um, few years about... Um, teams becoming more and more regimented in what they do and and um, really sort of getting very granular on, on small details. Um, you know, how much the sort of the, the, this theme of overthinking and trying to over um, sort of control the variables might become a bit of a theme both this year and over the next few years. I mean, there was another interview with um, Rowan Dennis where I, I think, you know, he would probably be quite um, open about the fact that that's that's not necessarily been his issue, um, but you know him talking about the, the 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 risk he felt he was running of developing an, an eating disorder, and um, you, you know it's it's not necessarily a, a sort of one size fits all um, as far as well, pros and current pros are concerned, and and you know this hyper sort of scientific, hyper regimented, um, hyper granular approach is not for every rider. Certainly, if Paulus is to be believed, he abandoned the 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 the, the plan that was set for him by Jumbo Visma in the second half of last season, and, and actually, you know, performed really well at the Vuelta. So, if that's what happened, then. Um, it seems that it wasn't a system that worked for him, and and I think he's actually a very very uh, promising prospect who who might do great things at EF Education first. But clearly, it's working for some people at Jumbo Visma. I think Stephen Kreuzwick have mentioned. I think a lot of it flows from him. You know, I think that he's almost like a lab rat in a way. And and my time with the team last year emphasised this point that he had been a guy who for whom this approach definitely works. He he is incredibly dedicated um, and, and I think they, they, they use him as a sort of role model for the rest of the team. Uh, he sets the tone and I think the example of, of him and the progress he's been able to make, gradual progress each year, um, has been very influential in, in, in that team but not everybody is Stephen Kreuzwick and it might not work for them all but, you know, they have got a very, very strong team and they've got clearly a bit more money now as well and if you look at the support that they can put around, you know, it's not just the trident of De Moulin, Kreuzwick and Roglic, but it's guys like Sepp Kuss, Robert Hessink, Tony Martin. It's a very, very strong team. And, and man for man, uh, it will be at least the equal of Team Ineos. But I think we'll talk a little bit more about Team Ineos later on. Um, I'm also looking forward to seeing how the the young generation get on this year because it's a kind of second album syndrome. Um Remco Evenepoel, Egan Bernal, Tadej Pogacar, Pog, and uh, Pavel Sivakov as well, I'd throw in there. Um, those guys all had incredible seasons and wins last year. Um, you know, might, might it be more difficult for them this year? I, I, you know, will, their, will their progress be linear? Um, I suspect not, because I don't, I don't imagine that Remco Evenepoel is going to get better every year. Um, so far in his short career, that has been the case, but I don't think it's possible that he can get better every year. Um, so I think one of those guys might take a slight step back or sideways this year. And it'll be very interesting to see, looking further ahead, how they respond to that. Because that will be the test, of course, of you know how far they go in the long run. Yeah, I certainly think Evan Paul has got the world at his feet hasn't he but um the the pressure really ramps up in the bigger races Uh, you know winning the san sebastian classic in the way he did was one of the most impressive performances of 2019 by anybody of any age Um, but when it comes to you know the the biggest classics the you know the world championships the olympic road race perhaps um you know the, the pressure will be magnified the same with pogacar you know no longer is he the um, you know the the youngest rider in the race, um, the sensation. You know, after 
a couple of years or so, there'll be a, no, a new young rider coming along and uh, people will, you know, it, it's difficult to, as you say, Richard, it isn't just about um, making the, the, you know, announcing the arrival. It's about um, building a career and, uh, you know, putting year two, year three, year four on top of that impressive first year. So, And the, the third um, intriguing thing for me this year really is Movistar, which is almost... It's almost a new team in 2020, and there are probably various factors for that, not least the falling out with uh, the, the pastry chef, um, the agent who is agent to so many South American riders. Uh, and it's not been confirmed yet, but Andre Amador, I think, is the latest uh, rider to go from Movistar to Team Ineos. He's been spotted training in Ineos kit, although the, the transfer hasn't been confirmed yet. But Movistar for this year I mean they've got 14 new riders um, which is the most I think of any team outside of Israel startup nation which is of course new to the world tour um, but they've got 10 riders who are 25 or under and 5 of those riders 22 or under so it's a really you know there's a really new influx of very very young riders indeed um, they've also got 11 uh, different nationalities represented in the team Movistar this year which is a huge cultural change for them you know they were uh, a few years ago very Spanish team Spanish and South American um, Pachi Vila has joined as head of performance from Bora Hansgrohe he's been pretty successful there of course he was at Tinkoff before that and has worked closely with Peter Sagan in the past um, so it's um, it's a real reboot for Movistar I was you know, I was average. It was I was just calculating the average age. Of course, average age is still quite high because they've still got Alejandro Valverde. If you take him out, it drops by about five years. But um, they they don't have an awful lot of riders. I mean, if you if you think of riders being in their peak between like twenty eight and thirty two, ten of the riders are are in that age category. But there aren't a lot of great you know big stars in that age category. They'll be very. They've lost Michelanda. They've lost Naira Quintana. Quintana in particular has been along with Valverde central to the identity of that team. And so, Enric Mas has come in. He's a young Spanish rider, um, promising but unproven. A lot is resting on his shoulders. Mark Soler as well. But you really get the sense that they are kind of transforming into an, a more international team and a much younger team. And looking three or four years down the road, it seems. I spoke to Gabriel Cullig the other day, who is a new rider on that team, a British rider, more of a sprinter, a classics rider. Um, he is looking forward to the classics. He's going to have a lot of opportunities there. And I think in the next few weeks, we will ha do a special feature on Movistar in one of the episodes. We've got an interview you did with Eusebio Unzue, the, the man who's been in charge for 40 years at that team. Uh, I think we'll hear from his son and from Cullig as well. Yeah, um, Unzwe gave a, an interesting interview in the in the Spanish press a couple of weeks ago, Rich, in which he talked about sort of Landa in, in fairly wistful terms, um, suggesting that, yeah, he will, he will probably one day win a Grand Tour. He's got what it takes, but unfortunately now it won't be with Movistar. And then also being um, all sort of quite explicit about the fact that he, he thinks that Quintana's best days as a Grand Tour rider are over and he can't fight for... Um, general classification um, anymore um, and, and then just the point you made on um, Aquadro the Italian agent um, who's fallen out with Unzue I mean it, that creates a real problem because um, as you've said um, Aquadro has most of the top South American riders and Telefonica the sort of parent group of Movistar um, have huge interests in in South America so not really a great look for them not to have a, a you know one of these um, this sort of galaxy of, of South American stars in their roster. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science in Sport. And if you want to stock up for the, the winter ahead uh, of your Science in Sport goodies, go to scienceinsport.com and you can still use the 25% off discount. That's SISCP25 at the checkout, SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. And a big thanks to Science and Sport for um, extending yet again their sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast, which we really appreciate. It's uh, long running now, isn't it? It goes back to the Giro d'Italia in 2016. Um, it's going to be the longest running sponsorship, sponsorship in, in cycling. pro cycling. Probably. I, I also... 
Rich, this will this will vex you um, early in the new year. But um, I, I noticed one of the Arsenal players, Lucas Torreira, the Uruguayan midfielder, the other day getting an SIS gel uh, with about 10 minutes to go in uh, the game. I think it was against Man United. Um, he was struggling a bit. They'd done a lot of running in that game. And yeah, um, so footballers now using gels in the middle of games. Well, um, SIS do supply officially uh, Manchester United. Uh, but they unofficially supply a lot of other clubs, um, including my team, Watford. I, I don't know whether that has extended this season, but certainly last season they were supplying uh, supplying Watford. I think so Science and Sport might want you to keep quiet about that, Lionel. Um, uh, absolutely not. We've <laughs> been on a tremendous run. They mu- <laughs> oh, Watford really? Yeah, they must, have well. ta- must have had some gels oh, on about December the 20th because we won four league games in a row, or three, three league games and a draw. Uh, in four oh, right. over I'm, Christmas, I realised that soaring away from the dis- dis- soaring away from the hear. bottom of the table, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Mikel Arteta in charge at Arsenal now. He's a, he's a Basque, isn't he? He is. He, he too always, always reminds me of Mikel Landa. I don't know. I think physically they they look quite similar. They've got the same first name, the same first name, dark hair, <laughs> um, goodness, olive skinned, but they do. Rem- they've got a sort of strong, silent type about them um, win, yeah. win lose or draw Arteta's expression doesn't change uh, no Landa's the same isn't he my um, god guys can we not get back to the cycling Landa <laughs> I actually I, I interviewed Landa at the Bahrain McLaren launch and we might hear that interview at some point um, uh, he you know he he is uncontested leader at the Tour de France and Rod Ellingworth really thinks he can win it but I tried to sort of um, ask him about the whole free Landa campaign and whether he enjoyed being a guy that people rooted for because he always you know had some sort of uh, you know misfortune in terms of a teammate going slightly better than him but he didn't really take the bait on that one I, I don't think he really does enjoy that at all I think he'd rather win what a surprise what th- what three things are you looking forward to Lionel well uh, I'll do the quick fire round here three you things. can't say li- napalm it can't be starter main course and dessert <laughs> that, we, we won't accept that <laughs> well funny you should say that uh, we might come on to that in a minute but um, first up uh, De Koenig quick step um, disappointing season by their standards last year. Just, oh, yeah, the, really? just the 68 wins really after 73 poor. wins the previous season. You have to, if you go back to 2012, uh, De Koenig quick step, quick step floors, uh, whatever they've been called, they've won at least 50 races a year. Uh, 2011, they won only nine races. So, um, yeah. Nine? Nine. That, that's that was, right. that was Jonathan the Anna's list for Jonathan Vortis team, recently pointed out when in the discussion about relegation and promotion that in 2011 if a relegation system had been in place in the World Tour, they'd have, they'd have dropped out. Mm. Yeah, they had an absolute shocker and really uh, a sort of a, a revolution from there. And, uh, well, one of the things that we've often talked about um, with Patrick Lefebvre, and it's something that came up in my conversation with him this time last year, which we put out for Friends of the Podcast last year, uh, his kind of ruthless, single-minded focus when it comes to uh, letting riders go when, frankly, they become too expensive for him. Um, he, he's, you know, he cuts the emotion out of it, it seems to me, and lets people move on um, when he feels he can't pay them what they're either what they want or what they uh, are perceived to be worth by others. And, uh, you know, he's not fr- frightened to let people go and uh, freshen up and, and evolve the team. And so it is again, you know, two years ago, lost Fernando Gaviria to UAE Team Emirates. Um, this winter, Elia Viviani has moved to Cofidis after a so-so season, really, with them last year. It wasn't, you know, wasn't, wasn't bad, but didn't get, a, didn't get a win at the Giro, did he? Or rather, did get a win, but then it was uh, taken away from him for an irregular sprint, and he never really got, not, never really got back on top after that, uh, certainly not in the Giro. And the long-awaited transfer of Sam Bennett from Bora Hansgrohe to De Koenig Quickstep was confirmed in uh, very late November or, or December. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how Bennett does because I think he is more than just a sprinter. We, we gather that he will ride the Tour de France and um, it will be the first time that he goes back to the Tour de France as a, as a, a bona fide winner. Um, but he's going to be in a position in that team where not only will he have plenty of opportunities to win, but there will be a real expectation on his shoulders to win. My money would be on Sam Bennett having a much better season than Elia Viviani. I I would, I would agree with you there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bet against that 
No, I think that the team set up there is is so focused on winning um, that that when the opportunities come round, everybody knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing in order to get somebody over the line first. Um, One guy in particular who I'm seeing on your screen there, Lionel Michael Markov, uh, who's you know he was so instrumental in so many of Viviani's wins, and actually was missing at the Giro, which I think was important, and I think he could be absolutely key to Bennett and he's such a good lead out man um, and pilot in that you know the closing couple of kilometres of races that if he forms a good understanding with Bennett they could be a quite formidable duel and yet ironically he's also sorry sorry, sorry, he's also got um, he's also brought Archibald um, Archibald with him of course so I guess Morco will play the same role that he did with Riquese and Gaviria so he'll be the penultimate man They've got all, uh, all hairstyles covered there, haven't they? Archibald yeah. and Morkov. Um, ironically, though, the Tour de France doesn't really offer the greatest number of uh, opportunities for the sprinters, uh, certainly not when compared to the Giro d'Italia. So um, the, the sprinting is going to be interesting this season. I, I mean, it's, it's one, of the, uh, one of the things that we, we tend to kind of overlook a little bit, but when you think about the season as a whole, more races end in a sprint than not. Um, you know, when you when you factor in all of the Grand Tours, all of the one-day races, all of the week-long stage races, and so on, there are a lot more sprinting opportunities than um, than, than 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 anything else. Um, you got data on this, Lionel? I have actually, but I haven't got it with me. Um, but I will, I will, I will share some of this data. Put that in the episode notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, the, the Giro is going to have quite a strong sprinting field, isn't it? Peter Sagan will be there. Dylan Grunewagen. Uh, Talk, going back to Jumbo Visma, a casualty of their single-minded focus on the uh, the yellow jersey is that Groenewegen probably, almost certainly, won't be at the Tour de France. Well, he won't be because they've announced the team well, already. I know, but come on. I mean, if if something serious happens in the first six months of the season, are you telling me that, that Jumbo Visma aren't going to deviate at all from that strategy? I- Rich, I, I was also struck by... Um, by that in the sense that I remember, I think it was in your um, Jumbo mm. Visma special last year that Richard Plugger talks about this vision he had of being competitive on every day of the Tour de France. And, you know, if, if Wout van Aert is back to his best, which we, we obviously hope, but we, we haven't seen proof of that yet, um, he will be able to compete in the bunch sprints. Um, they'll be missing Grenovagen, of course, and also Mike Turnison, who won the, the sprint um, for the yellow jersey in the first stage. But, um, yeah, they, they, they won't necessarily be quite as um, well-equipped in the sprints as they were certainly last year, will they? Well, secondly, Daniel, you joke that my three highlights of the year are starter, main course and dessert. Well, I am looking forward to going to Hungary for the start of the uh, Giro d'Italia, um, not least because um, it will be an opportunity to have some authentic goulash. No? Yes, um, no I'm also looking forward to the wine. L- Lionel um, and Hungary are, are two words that you hear in, a, in the same sentence quite a lot. <laughs> I, I'm also looking forward to um, well the the second stage um, in particular. So I I'm not particularly um, au fait with with Hungarian geography, but um, I, I have looked a bit at the route of the first stage, and we go alongside a lake um, called Lake Batalon, I think it's called, um, and it's the largest inland lake in in Central Europe inland lake it's the largest lake in central europe <laughs> most lakes most lakes these days tend to be inland um and um the the northern shore of um that particular lake is a is quite a well-known um wine growing area um and some very strange um unusual exotic grape varieties grown there um not stuff you'll find anywhere else anywhere else in europe I've never been to Hungary, uh, never been to Budapest, particularly looking forward to seeing, you know, the very grand squares and the Danube. Um, and I, I do think that, you, you know, we, we've, we've sometimes um, been a little bit critical of, of cycling's tendency to follow the money. Um, you know, the Giro d'Italia has, has clearly been looking... Um, to monetize its uh, product by going to other countries for the for but the if it, if it takes us somewhere we quite want to go, then we're all in <laughs> favour. <laughs> well, well, but it does. It does. It does 
broaden one's horizons to go and see places with your own eyes and i think that that's a you know hungary is is somewhere that's been on my list of places to go and visit um just to to see um i do think that that the uci and uh, whatever forces are motivating the uci to have this strange rule about um grand departs grande partenzas or or whatever the spanish equivalent is daniel um when, salida. Exactly. When when the race starts in a foreign country, um, the the best thing for the race, for the riders, uh, for the whole of the infrastructure is to be able to start on the Friday and then travel on the Monday back to um, the host country. And because of this strange rule, which restricts the Grand Tours from doing that any more than once in every four Grand Tours, uh, once in every four editions, the, the Giro has to start in Hungary on the Saturday, have two more stages on the Sunday and the Monday, and then get to Sicily over basically on Monday night and, and resume with a, a stage on, on Tuesday afternoon. And I, I just think that it's a, it's a rule that exists for, um, for, for what reason, for what greater good. It will just put pressure on everybody and not least um, the riders and staff who have to uh, keep up with the, with the schedule. So I think if, uh, you know, thinking more broadly about things and thinking about what is best for the, for the athletes and for the teams, um, it's probably a rule that the UCI needs to look at. And, and Napalm, and I don't actually know, just, just practically speaking, I don't actually know how the teams will... Um, transport everything from um, Hungary to Sicily I'm talking about the vehicles in particular the the team buses and so forth um, it, it, I, I, I guess they'll probably have to have two different buses um, and two different sort of fleets of vehicles one lot that are waiting in Sicily and, and one lot in Hungary yeah I mean Matt White uh, said I mean they hadn't done the, the full logistics on it but did say that it would be um, you know a combination of you know teams that have got two buses one one can go to Hungary one can be waiting for them in Sicily but then you know rental vehicles and what have you and and, and two two lots of staff and and just to cover the, the, the weekend at the start it logistically it does place a tremendous strain on people but I guess you know May is a little bit lighter in the sense that there isn't the the tour of california this year so that um that eases the, the logistics a little bit but um yeah sometimes cycling doesn't help itself in some of these things just hey uh, you've got team ineos up on your screen there Lionel. we haven't really talked about them but uh, you finish your three things that's two that's two of them the oh, third sorry, thing I is, like, team, sorry, I is team ineos somebody has to mention yeah, well, team ineos chris froom um well, the, the, the thing I'm not looking forward to is the, the endless debate about who the leader is um, at the Tour de France. And I think that's going to be the inevitable kind of narrative that we all, to a degree, get Who do you think into. will be the leader at the Tour de France? <laughs> well, I actually think that it suits uh, Team Ineos to um, have two leaders. And, and I think that there's enough evidence now uh, over the previous years to see that they excel at having two people um, well placed overall they they finished first and second a number of times in the Tour de France going all the way back to uh, Bradley Wiggins and Chris Froome in 2012 um, Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome uh, Egan Bernal and Geraint Thomas last year of course and I think that it's and Mikel a, it's, Landa fourth one year wasn't it Mikel Landa up there as well I think this this kind of story that there's some choice to be made and, and that we all obsess about who's number one and who's number two I think it works perfectly for Dave Brailsford, works perfectly for the riders, for everyone to be kind of distracted by that as as the story, as the narrative um, going into the Tour de France. It, it spreads the load, it spreads the pressure, it means that they can kind of retrospectively um, decide on their tactics after the road has decided and they can say, oh well it was always our idea that, which to the to a degree they did during last year's Tour de France. It was, it was always going to be Egan Bernal who was going to come to the fore in those last um, mountain stages in the Alps um, and I think that they will do the same at the Giro w by sending uh, the defending champion Richard Carapaz and Geraint Thomas to the Giro and then at the Tour de France Egan Bernal uh, Chris Froome and possibly Geraint Thomas if he comes out of the Giro I well mean, and, yeah. and so if if they're going to go head to head with Jumbo Visma why not go head to head numerically as well as uh, anything else some speculation about the the uh, the, the state of Chris Froome's recovery and fitness. He, well, Dario Cioni was quoted as saying that he'd gone home early from a, a training camp. Chris Froome then sought to cold poured 
they pour cold water on and I, that. And, and I understand, Rich, that Choney was quite aggrieved at, at how, um, in what context he'd been quoted. Right. It, it was an Italian monthly magazine that quoted him, and he felt that he was speaking in in some sense off the record or that it wasn't a formal interview. No such thing as off the record, is there? I did try and contact Chris Froome just to find out, but he did say on social media that he, you know, that, that, that this was nonsense. Um, but I think there are questions there, and that might influence whether, say, Garrett Thomas goes to G or not, because I agree with you, Lionel, that that would seem to make, make a lot of sense. There's been a lot of a lot of hints that, that Garrett Thomas would go to the Giro this year. Um, and I think that would be the, the plan A, that Garrett Thomas and Carapaz at the Giro and Froome and Bernal at the Tour. But we've seen uh, just last year that they, unlike Jumbo Visma setting out who, who's going to do what in December, uh, last year Ineos changed their plans at very short notice, didn't they? Bernal was going to go to the Giro um, and then, then didn't crashed. go to the Giro. Crashed and, and then didn't go to the Giro. And then, of course, you know, this professional cycling, you just never know what is going to come down and the road. And I, I mean, think well, one thing for them to address is is the, the the performance of the rest of the team at the tour last year, and and they were they were they got away with it. But if they're going up against a very strong Jumbo Visma team, they might not get away with it again. Sivakov, Pavel Sivakov, I understand will ride the tour, or is is the plan is for him to ride the the Tour de France this year, which I think is he's a very strong uh, rider to put into that team. One other thing I'm looking forward to uh, is Lionel getting team names wrong in oh. 2020. Um, I love how, I mean, I pointed this out, but earlier on you said Wanty Group Gobert. It's actually, they're now actually Circus Wanty Gobert. To give them. You're allowed three uh, sponsor names now in teams. Uh, so that's what they are this I'm, year. I'm There's a bit of a... Bit of I'm a not looking... Sorry, I'm Daniel. not looking forward to the, the. I'm not looking forward to the mass deployment, or probably there'll probably be conscription involved of the pronunciation police in Hungary because. Oh, um, oh brilliant! Yeah, Hungarian is a very difficult language. One of the most difficult languages, for, probably in the world, to to learn. Well, um, fortunately, Lionel and I have both been taking intensive lessons in Hungarian, <laughs> uh, and we're 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 going there in fully intending and with the sole aim of of shaming you uh, in hungary mm. daniel it's three days of just bliss yeah. i think um well i'm i'm looking forward to seeing how orica green edge and garmin get on this season. Merry, bit of merry go round of sponsors <laughs> of alperson have have jumped ship again how many teams of alperson now so they're now sponsoring uh, matthew van der poel's team uh and the second it's only the second one third Rich. third because they were a giant Alperson, weren't oh, they? Oh, correct, correct. I mean, yeah. they've got a terrible track record, Alperson, actually, of um, sponsoring teams and then the team not doing very well. Mm. They have not sponsored as many teams, I don't think, Rich, as Vini Fantini stroke Farnese, which I think is the same company, who are now who have now resurfaced on the jersey of Israel Startup Nation. I'm, I'm waiting for Alperson to sponsor a team run by Bjarne Reese with uh, Levi Leifheimer as uh, team, lead, team leader. Yeah. Um, get, get, all the, get all the baldies in the Alperson team. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, so much to look forward to. So much to look forward to. The, the year is unfolding before us. What have we got look, to look forward to in the, on the podcast, Lionel? Well, on the podcast front, I've been booking a few assignments. Um, I'm off to Slovenia at the end of the month for something that may end up being a Friends of the Podcast episode, or it might be well, a regular better. episode. <laughs> Are you ski um, jumping with Rog? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lionel goes ski jumping with Rog. Um, the, yeah. the friend special to end all friend specials. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> would certainly be my last contribution to the friends <laughs> specials. I think if I went ski jumping, um, booked a few interviews in, and uh, well, I'm, I'm beavering away on the uh, the Re- reborn explore series, which will launch at the end of this month or beginning of next. Haven't quite decided on the dates yet, but that is underway and uh, well we've got a very big announcement i think next week um a new collaboration a very a exciting couple of big new announcements, collaboration i think we've got a new a new contributor as well for explorer that'll be a big announcement as well so indeed well listen let's leave it there uh, for their chats we've, we've barely scratched the surface of what we're looking forward to in 2020 it's going to be another huge year for the cycling podcast yeah very much business as usual for us isn't it we've got our monthly episodes of cycling podcast femina service course and explore and if you haven't listened to the most recent service course i urge you to do so it's absolutely fascinating i learned an awful lot and uh, that's presented by tom wally 
and Lizzie Banks, uh, Bigla Katusha rider. And, uh, well, we've got the, our Grand Tour coverage to look forward to as well. As usual, G daily coverage from Giro, the Tour and the Vuelta, and lots more besides. Before we go this week, chaps, can we say a few thank yous to uh, those of, of you, some of you who've signed up as friends of the podcast. Very, very grateful indeed to you. So a big thanks from me to Thomas Bridges, Tony Moffa, Michael Payne, uh, John Seelberg, hope I've said that correctly, David Wokes, William Valkeoja, again, I hope I've said that correctly, Andrew Scott, uh, Adam Glover, Paul Whitelock and Jeff Money. And a big thank you to Mike Fagan, Chris Cole, Gerald Libersin, Peter Dash, Phil Healy, John Klein, James Sells, Arno Polman, Elizabeth Miller and Beth Hazlitt. And from me to David Warboys, Keith Jackson, Ben Chat, Michael, sorry, Mike Thornborough, Mark McBride, Joseph Galitzin, um, Peter Joyce, Julie Gill, Tessa Colster and Matt Lane. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps. You have been listening to The Cycling Podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter at thecyclingpodcast.com to get all the latest news and special offers delivered straight to your inbox. This episode was edited and produced by Tom Wally. Tom Wally.